When most of us think back to the human exploration of outer space, we probably remember stories of triumph, tragedy, and healthy competition fueled by scientific curiosity. Sure, there was competition, but only because America and the USSR both wanted the glory of being the first. The first satellite, the first man in space, the first space station, and the first man on the moon. But it would be naive, given the tensions of the Cold War, to assume that the warring superpowers would limit space exploration to purely scientific pursuits, even if that's what everyone agreed to. Neither side could resist pondering the nefarious possibilities that lie in the stars beyond. Or at least they couldn't shake the feeling that the other side wasn't going to follow the rules. For every leap forward in the space race, a looming fear went with it, as each innovation could potentially be twisted into some militaristic end. After all, what's the only thing we associate with rockets more than spaceflight? Every unmatched step the other side took toward dominance among the stars brought the world closer to a terror unmatched in reality or fiction. Space nukes. Space, a final frontier. Man has likely dreamt of traveling to the stars since the dawn of thought. And he's probably dreamt of dropping bombs from them since about 1944. And those men doing the dreaming were wearing black leather trench coats with red armbands. Yes, the dreaded V-2 rocket was the first long-range guided ballistic missile, and it was a revolution in rocketry, weaponry, and spaceflight too. In fact, the first man-made object to slip the surly bonds was a two-stage rocket consisting of a WAC corporal sitting atop an actual V-2 missile. Now, this was part of a post-war test run by the United States, but it was a Nazi rocket designed by a former SS officer, Werner von Braun, a man who would become of essential importance to the United States space race efforts. Fittingly and forebodingly, the Bumper Project represents the as-yet unbroken link between the human exploration of space and that classic human pastime of war-making. Nazis from the moon. By the mid-50s, the US and USSR had made great use of their Nazi rocketeers, and both sides managed to produce rockets capable of breaching Earth's atmosphere. But now it was time to put stuff up there. Both sides wanted to be the first to orbit an actual satellite, and both sides pledged to do just that as part of the so-called International Geophysical Year. This high-minded and even higher-hoping project saw some of the first scientific intercourse between the East and West since the end of the war, and space was the hot new frontier for the big brains of the late 50s. Space is the new scientific frontier. The sky is no longer the limit. Both the US and USSR promised to put satellites into orbit for the project, but of course it would be the USSR that finally did it. Two words, Sputnik. Sputnik 1 took to the skies and beyond in 1957, sitting atop a modified R-7 rocket, the world's first ICBM. Now the US really had something to worry about. Pretty soon they have damn space platforms up there to drop nuclear bombs on us, like rocks from a highway overpass. Not only did the Russians beat us to space, but they used a very powerful rocket to do it. The country was swept with a noxious blend of wonder and horror as Sputnik beeped amongst the stars. Man had finally put a beach ball in space, but did that mean the Russians could also deliver hydrogen bombs through the same surly bonds they had just slipped? If they could, there would be nothing America could have done to stop them. But another discovery during the IGY might have spelled salvation for the free world, or at least something close to it. When the US finally caught up to the Soviets the following year, their Explorer 1 satellite confirmed the existence of the Van Allen radiation belts. Without getting too deep in the science weeds here, the belts are energized particles that occur naturally in our atmosphere. They are, painfully simply put, the result of solar winds and cosmic rays that are trapped in the Earth's magnetosphere. But what the hell does that mean for missiles and such? 
Well, if you got enough of those particles, it would make electronics go absolutely haywire, including the delicate guidance systems aboard ICBMs. Of course, man would eventually discover that the Van Allen belts are not lethal to man or machine if you pass through them quick enough, but there was one man who saw the natural belts as a model for a defensive ploy straight out of science fiction. A layer of electrons could conceivably be established sufficiently dense to overheat and actually destroy by burning any penetrating ICBM. But how could one produce the massive amounts of electrons needed to create this force field? Well, according to the project's intellectual father, Nicholas Christophilos, all that was required was a nuclear bomb. Simple. Of course! Christophilos was a bombastic and unconventional scientist. Lacking a doctorate or any real credentials, he made his way into the scientific community by brute force and unshakable persistence. Unhampered by the mores of long-term tenure, Christophilos was free to dream, and dream big. He theorized that if detonated at the right altitude, the electrons produced from a nuclear weapon might be trapped in the magnetic field and spread from pole to pole like a shield. If a quantity of relativistic electrons is properly injected into this field at a given point, some percentage of them would not only be trapped into shuttling back and forth along the field lines, but would also migrate eastward, spreading a shell of electrons entirely around the Earth. Now, before you cry madman, Christophilos' theory was backed up by respected members of the American scientific community, and Christophilos seized the opportunity to push forward his ideas. It is not I who am crazy. It is I who am mad. But unlike his new contemporaries at Brookhaven, Christophilos had more in mind than scientific affirmation. The crazy Greek, as he was known, was a patriot, funny enough, and he feared Russian ICBMs just as much as the next American, so he wanted to do something about it. It was time to test his theory and protect the USA. With a cushy new government position in hand, Christophilos was able to present his ideas to people who could do something with them, i.e. the AEC and the US military, and they quickly took up the task in an operation that would be dubbed Argus. It was 1958, and the US had already done more than its fair share of testing. In fact, they were just finishing Operation Hardtack 1 in the South Pacific, including on Bikini Atoll. Sounds interesting. But more important for Argus were the high-altitude tests performed on Johnston Island. Real quick, high altitude in this case seems to mean beyond the troposphere, though other sources claim it would need to be higher than 100,000 feet to be considered high altitude. But whatever the case, high-altitude blasts are characterized by a lack of effective force on the ground and a plethora of weird and wacky effects in the atmosphere. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Hard tack teak and orange detonated well above the troposphere, and well above 100,000 feet in the case of teak. The teak explosion was a sort of litmus test for Argus, unintentionally of course, but it showed that nukes would indeed cause all kinds of phenomena when exploded at great heights. The blast created striking visuals, including an artificial aurora and a fireball unlike any before it. But in addition, it also caused radio blackouts from Hawaii to as far away as Australia, and there were even reports of temporary flash blindness amongst those that inadvertently viewed the test. But as spectacular and scientifically significant as the hard tack tests were, they did not definitively prove or disprove Christophilos' theory, so Argus would have to go even higher than Teak. The tests were set to go down in the summer of 1958, but unlike the myriad tests before them, the Argus tests would be shrouded in secrecy. A fleet of nine ships would make their covert way to the unwelcoming South Atlantic, a site chosen for its remoteness and longitudinal alignment with the United States. With the nearest island being the famously far-flung Tristan da Cunha, the task force would need to launch their precious cargo off the back of a ship. The USS Norton Sound, a converted seaplane tender, would cradle the finicky X-17 missiles as they rocked precariously over the foaming waves. The missiles needed to fly straight up, straight up for the desired effect, so an analog computer would be used to trigger the launch when the ship rocked into the right position. The skinny X-17s would be armed with relatively low-yield W-25 warheads, delivering a mere 1.7 kiloton bomb. This would be all that was needed to prove Christophilos' theory, and there was no reason to burst a big one before they knew what it might do. But how would they know that the electrons they were injecting would do what they predicted? 
Well, the answer was more space-age tech, of course. The US would use the recently orbited Explorer 4 satellite to measure the results of the explosions from space. They would also fire several sounding rockets from the mainland US to get a more direct and practical reading from the tests. Lastly, not all the ships would be in close proximity to the launch, with the USS Albemarle positioned in the Azores off the coast of Portugal, roughly 5,000 miles away. So needless to say, this was a massive undertaking. Not as grandiose as Operation Crossroads, perhaps, but that was by design. These tests would be observed from across the sea, from all the way back home in the US, and even from space itself. So how'd it go? Well, of the three rockets launched, only one of them achieved the desired altitude. The reasons for this could be blamed on the weather, of course, and the incredibly unpredictable nature of rocketry. Anyone who knows anything about rockets knows that a 33% success rate is not too bad. In fact, all three rockets detonated in the atmosphere, and all three blew up higher than the Teak explosion. But Argus 3 was the only one to achieve the desired altitude of 540 kilometers. Wrong! And guess what? It was a complete success. Well, it sort of was. I guess I should say it did what they thought it would do, but not as much as they thought it would. First and foremost, the test proved Christophilos' theory beyond a doubt. The satellite Explorer 4 again found high energy electron zones in the exosphere. Van Allen himself led the team that examined the data collected from Explorer 4, showing that not only did Argus create its own radiation belt, but that it was distinct from the natural belts that bore his name. The charged particles emanated from the blast zone, sweeping longitudinally from pole to pole. Christophilos was right, and a canopy of electrons was now blanketing the Earth's atmosphere. But it wasn't the science fiction force field he had been counting on. Any amount of radiation in the atmosphere presents a danger to spacecraft and potentially to ICBMs, but the Argus test was no more a hazard than the rads that were already there. Though this wasn't exactly a surprise to the scientists of the day, as Argus 3 was a relatively tiny bomb in comparison to Teak. It was only 1.7 kilotons after all. Surely a more useful result could be had if the yield had been higher. It was time to dial up the megatons. But before we move on, I want to talk about one of my favorite topics on this channel. That's right, it's radiation safety. As you might have guessed, there wasn't much consideration given to radiation exposure during Argus, but the reason is even more insidious and skeevy than normal. The tests were so clandestine that even the crewmen on the ships were not made aware of their mission until they were well on their way to the Atlantic nowhere. As such, the military didn't bring enough radiation film badges for all the sailors. That would have drawn too much attention. Some servicemen did get their badges, mostly the technicians working directly with the ordnance and the aviators flying patrol during the blasts, but most were blissfully unaware of any radiation they might be receiving. An asset. An expendable asset. Now, it should be said that high-altitude tests are less dangerous to observers, excluding their eyes, My eye! because the radiation is trapped in the atmosphere, which is really great at dealing with the nasty stuff. But nevertheless, several members of the Argus task force reported cancers and other conditions that likely came from radiation exposure. And for once, the ending here is a little better than normal. Why, you ask? Because the tests were so secret and so little was officially logged that the military had no proof to state they provided due diligence to their sailors. So if you could prove you were on the task force and you had cancer, you were issued a payment of as much as $75,000. That's great, right? Super. It appears that extensive theoretical study is required to determine the electron trapping and spreading mechanism. Like I said before, Argus was basically a firecracker in the nuclear arsenal, so scientists were raring to put a bigger bomb in space. For science. But despite the US military's best efforts, they couldn't keep the lid on Argus for long. And surprise, surprise, the international community was not thrilled to hear the US secretly popped off a doomsday device in space. A truly global ethics problem was facing the nuclear powers of the day, one that persists even now. How can the peoples of Earth abide such dangerous and world-bending tests at the merest whims of the US and Soviet governments? Think about it. 
No one knew for sure what would happen with even the small bombs used during Argus. And now the US and Russia were ready to send even bigger nukes into our atmosphere. This not even mentioning the uh, nuclear war tensions. As such, the powers that were agreed to a tense moratorium on nuclear testing. Thank goodness. Anyway, the Russians broke the moratorium after just two years with this. Then these. Then this. That's right, the very year they bowed out of the test ban, they went and set off Tsar Bomba, the largest man-made explosion of all time. And for as scary as the big ol' super impractical, laughably unwieldy bomb was, the real headline, for us anyway, was that Argus the sequel was back on. Heck yeah! The Kennedy administration, for all its desire to escape the madness of brinksmanship, gave the scientists and the military the green light to continue testing. First came Operation Sunbeam and the oddly named Nougat, followed by the sweeping Operation Dominic. Operation Dominic took place in the Pacific and featured 31 separate nuclear explosions. Nine of these explosions made up the high altitude portion of the tests, collectively known as Operation Fishbowl. By this time, the idea of a literal force field was thought to be wishful thinking at best. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. But the implications of the radio blackouts from Teak needed more thorough investigation. In addition, the Yucca test also from Hardtack 1 produced another, even more alarming result that the fishbowl testers hoped to replicate. Time to get a tiny bit sciency. When a nuclear bomb detonates, it releases gamma rays, and those gamma rays create a burst of electromagnetic radiation when absorbed into the air or ground. All nukes do it, too. And this radiation can really make a mess of electronics. It's a lot like an electrical signal from a bolt of lightning, only much higher voltage rising as much as a hundred times faster. This phenomenon is known as an electromagnetic pulse. Like I said, every nuclear bomb releases an EMP, and we knew about them even before the Trinity test. But they were never all that concerning because ground-targeting nukes obliterate everything within the EMP range anyway. So your radio might be overloaded by an EMP, but also it melted and you're dead. But Yucca was different. Not only was the blast not destructive enough to preclude the danger posed by an EMP, but the electromagnetic wave released during Yucca behaved differently than ground tests. But the instruments designed to read these differences didn't work at the time, so Fishbowl was meant to suss out the dangers. And oh boy, it would sure do that. The tests were set to go down on Johnston Island near Hawaii. In this time, there was no rush and no veil of secrecy to hamper the integrity of the tests. There was, however, a super finicky rocket that just wouldn't work. The Thor rocket was chosen to carry the hydrogen bombs into space for the tests. But it failed not once, not twice, not thrice, but four times throughout the tests. And each time it meant the loss of not only the rocket, but the warhead as well. Three of them were aborted in flight, and one even blew up on the pad, irradiating the launch area. They had to rebuild and decontaminate the whole area before tests could resume. But the first and most memorable success of Operation Fishbowl came on July 9th, 1962, after the launch of Starfish Prime. The Thunder God finally smiled on the testers and carried the W-49 warhead 250 miles into the air, where it detonated just as planned. The Starfish Prime Blast was a truly spectacular explosion, and it had quite the audience too. Some of which were none too happy to see the sky lit up like the end of the world. Samoan Islanders who weren't warned were understandably panicked at the nighttime sun, but still others were excited by the aurora the blast promised, with many Hawaiians taking up vantage points to view the explosion. This excerpt from the DoD's official report provides a succinct description of the light show provided by Starfish Prime. A brilliant white flash burned through the clouds, rapidly changing to an expanding green ball of irradiance extending into the clear sky from above the overcast. 
From its surface extruded great white fingers, resembling cirrostratus clouds, which rose to 40 degrees above the horizon in sweeping arcs turning downward toward the poles and disappearing in seconds to be replaced by spectacular concentric cirrus-like rings moving out from the blast at tremendous initial velocity, finally stopping when the outermost ring was 50 degrees overhead. They did not disappear, but persisted in a state of frozen stillness. All this occurred, I would judge, within 45 seconds. As the purplish light turned to magenta and began to fade at the point of burst, a bright red glow began to develop on the horizon at a direction of 50 degrees north of east and simultaneously 50 degrees south of east, expanding inward and upward until the whole eastern sky was a dull burning red semicircle, 100 degrees north to south and halfway to the zenith, obliterating some of the lesser stars. This condition, interspersed with tremendous white rainbows, persisted no less than 90 minutes. But what about the Christophilos effect? What about the radiation belts and EMPs? Well, the results of Starfish were pretty telling. First of all, the EMP was far flung and widely felt in Hawaii, shutting down streetlights and causing burglar alarms to go off. It also killed telephone lines and similarly affected radio communications. Just to put that into perspective, Hawaii was 900 miles away from the blast, and that's super important for reasons we'll get into later. The explosion also created another radiation band, just as expected. And similarly expected, this band was much bigger and more intense than the Argus band. This created a big problem for orbiting satellites, of which Starfish Prime killed at least six. Kill Trocity. Amongst this kill count was Britain's first satellite, Ariel 1, and the famous Telstar 1, the first commercial communication satellite and namesake of the famous instrumental rock tune. Funnily enough, the song Telstar remained at chart altitude for longer than the satellite remained in orbit. The destructive radiation band raised further concerns about the safety of astronauts, and cosmonauts for that matter, that might be orbiting during such a blast. And by raise concerns, I mean it totally would have killed them just like it did the satellites. This is a bummer, man. The belts remained in the atmosphere for five years, and they even hampered study of the natural radiation belts whose understanding was paramount for the ongoing space race. These high altitude tests were no joke, and nobody was laughing. Operation Fishbowl was complete by 1962, and ended with the Tightrope Blast, a successful test of the Nike Hercules air defense system. This would be the last true atmospheric nuclear test the United States would conduct to date. But what about Russia? Surely they couldn't resist the prospect of atmospheric force fields and EMPs, right? Space. As it turns out, the Soviets knew about the Argus tests very shortly afterward, and they even reached similar hypotheses about the effects of high-altitude tests. So of course, of course, the Russians blew up nukes in space. And the results were even more foreboding than Starfish was. The first Soviet high-altitude tests occurred in 1961, and though they put a bomb 300 kilometers into the air, it was even weaker than Argus, so not much happened. A year later, they went forward with Project K, which kicked off with a 300 kiloton bomb detonating at 290 kilometers in the air, and the results were downright apocalyptic. The reason for this is all about location. The U.S., with the exception of the Nevada Proving Grounds, tended to do all of their testing in remote locations where the least amount of people might be affected. Or I guess I should say the least amount of American people might be affected. Ooh. Yeah. Russia chose scenic Kazakhstan as their proving grounds, specifically the Semipalatinsk test site, a place so full of nuclear terror that even the most Rick and Mortyest of skeptics might believe it was haunted. But what do you notice about this place? Yeah, it's landlocked, and surrounded by quaint villages, the perfect spot to test the most dangerous weapons ever. The Project K tests actually consisted of missiles fired from Kapustin Yar into central Kazakhstan, south of Semipalatinsk, detonating painfully close to the city of Zhezkazgan. Sorry. That's right, they set off an EMP-producing nuke over actual populated areas, and it did exactly what you'd think it would, 
It knocked out hundreds of miles of telephone lines, 620 miles of power cables, and even managed to start a fire in the Karaganda power plant over 300 miles away. Needless to say, it shut off power in places all over the country and caused a litany of problems throughout Kazakhstan. Another victory, Commander. The U.S. may have inconvenienced some Hawaiians with the starfish blast, but the Soviets were demonstrating a frighteningly effective weapon with civilian test subjects, intentionally or not. For as much of a perceived blunder this might have been, the Russians had discovered one of the most dangerous weapons the world had yet seen, one that will only become more potent as years pass, the atmospheric EMP. The Russians would take the threat of this weapon with them even after the fall of the Soviet Union, with U.S. Representative Roscoe Bartlett recalling a harrowing story from his time negotiating with the members of the Russian Duma in 1999. The delegates were discussing the ongoing Kosovo War, and apparently it wasn't going well. Deputy Duma Chairman Vladimir Lukin was particularly angry and let an offhand remark slip that had a profound effect on Representative Bartlett. Lukin, in a fit of frustrated rage, said, If we really wanted to hurt you, we would launch an SLBM from the ocean, detonate a weapon high above your country, and shut down your power grid and communications for six months. Bold words from a very pissed off Russian. And obviously they never made good on that petty threat. But it lit a fire of fear in the Maryland representative. Bartlett believed Lukin, and the congressional commissions he would start corroborated the validity of his fears. An EMP detonated above, say, Kansas, had the potential to shut down the entire continental United States, bringing the hyper-technical nation to its knees in mere moments. And this was over 20 years ago. Say, do we use a lot of technology today? Hey Alexa! Yes, the fear of electromagnetic pulse is a favorite amongst doomsday preppers, and it can certainly seem overblown if you've only heard of it from them. In fact, Bartlett himself is famous for leaving the public eye after losing a re-election bid in 2012 to live off the grid in the mountains of West Virginia. No power, no plumbing, no phones. Sounds fun. And one of the things that they did in downsizing the military was to waive chemical and EMP hardening of all of our new weapons systems. But the fears of Bartlett and others are not totally unfounded. Starfish prove that at least satellites are incredibly vulnerable to high-altitude nuclear explosions, and our infrastructure is heavily reliant on them to function, and our military is too. And while systems and infrastructure can be hardened against EMP to some degree, precious little has been done to prepare for such an attack, though it does seem that the U.S. government is taking the threat a little more seriously these days. I'm gonna have to go ahead and sort of disagree with you there. No one knows how bad it could actually get if an EMP is detonated over the U.S., but here's a brief list of all the things we use every day that rely on electricity. Yeah, everything. Everything we do needs electricity. I'm gonna go watch Survivor, man. Space, as of yet, remains demilitarized by international treaty, and to many, space represents the sort of unity we all dream of, the kind of utopian vision that inspired Star Trek. A beautiful thought to be sure, but there are many who believe that we have already gone past the point of no return when it comes to space. Sure, there aren't orbital missile platforms yet that we know of, but modern militaries are just as intrinsically linked to satellites as you and I and the birth of the various military space forces is a foreboding sign of things to come, not to mention the often forgotten threat of EMPs. And perhaps most heinously poetic of all, we've already soiled the final frontier with that most purest form of human evil. And if you think the 60s were the last time we ever considered militarizing space, well, just stay tuned for part two when I take a deep dive into the mythical world of Star Wars. It is time for a whole new stroke in strategic planning. Could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. I'm Congressman Newt Gingrich, the Republican co-chairman of the Congressional Space Caucus. 
The United States is at a crossroads in both its prosperity and its very survival. And the high frontier gives us a chance to leapfrog past the huge Russian army to regain our national security through developments in space. The space shuttle gives us an opportunity to...